thing I bought that shockproof phone case. Good evening. I'm going to give you a very simple tool today that will make you more intelligent or more smarter. This is an extremely simple and easy to apply tool, but you have to actually apply it. For it to work best, you have to apply it everywhere. You can't have little sections of your mind or belief systems where you don't apply it. If uh, you want to be able to think outside the box, think for yourself, all these things that people say, this will help with that a great deal. And it will crack open your mind and crack open your world and open up new possibilities. Warning, it will also mess with your belief systems. If you use it for real and you use it broadly, it will call into question pretty much everything. That is the point. So let's look at what intelligence is. I think a lot of people today would think that intelligence is like, let's say someone is able to go to college and get a PhD or something like that. They can go through that process. They have a job which uh, requires some kind of intelligence. But I would draw a big distinction between being smart and having, uh, say, like common sense versus kind of a mechanical intelligence. And this has to do largely with belief systems and uh, previous structures that we may be indoctrinated into. When people go through uh, schools and institutions and stuff like that, it's largely a process of indoctrination. Now that's not the only thing that happens and there can be a large element of um, you know, exploration, curiosity, and questioning things in a way, but it's often within a framework. So if you're questioning things within a closed framework, are you really questioning things? Like if you're leaving out a whole bunch of stuff that you've already decided is wrong because you're trapped into a belief system, is that inquiry really? It's inquiry within a matrix. So I draw a line between kind of a mechanical intelligence, say the ability to add a bunch of numbers together and come out with the right answer, or operate within an established framework and come up with uh, ideas that only fit that framework, for instance. History is littered with professors, philosophers, scientists who were completely full of it, who spent their entire lives doing work in a seemingly, you know, you could say intelligent way within a framework based on faulty assumptions that later were, you know, changed to a new paradigm where people think, you know, differently. So are those people intelligent? Yeah, I mean, in a way, they're, but they're operating within a closed framework, and this is the problem. If you want to think outside the box, that's not thinking outside the box. That's thinking within the box. Whether you made up the box or someone else made up the box, it's still a box. So what I'm going to offer you is tools that literally will have to make you go outside of that box, whatever your box is. And the problem is that we don't know we're in a box a lot of the time. Most people function on social things like growing up in a framework and sticking to that framework essentially. But what is thinking outside the box? What is free thinking? It's thinking outside of that matrix that you've been given. So real intelligence would be more open, right? It would be open-ended. It would inquire everywhere. It would look at everything without having all these stops and mazes and constructs that aren't really real that you know keep you within a certain belief system like don't don't go there don't go there yeah okay we're comfortable in here so now that we know the basic problem in the basic truth or what we're pretty sure is the basic truth how do we fit the data we have and the information have in our experience within that to make sense and a lot of that goes on a whole lot in research science uh scholastics uh what's the uh that's not the right term. Uh, well, I can't think of the right term right now. And some people would say that's because I'm not intelligent enough. We all have limits to our cognitive function, our 
ability of analysis. All of these things are very limited. And a fundamental message that I want to put forth in this video is that these limits are great uh, with all of us. We are only so smart, even the smartest people. We are only so dispassionate, right? We're not, uh, there's no Vulcans on planet Earth. So we can't have like perfect logic. We can't think of every possible thing. And we don't always know where our mental roadblocks are, where, where our locked doors are mentally. And the point of this exercise is essentially to start opening those doors. Just open them all. Let them be open. Don't be afraid to, to just, you know, inquire endlessly everywhere and uh, crack that world open. So this is uh, very simple. If you catch yourself saying these three words or wanting to say them, stop and examine carefully whether those words are appropriate at that moment. A huge percentage of the time when these words are used by most people, they are unwarranted. These two words, never and always, it's hard to argue against their very specific meaning in the language. Now, the way people use them now, they essentially don't mean what they're supposed to mean and the purpose they are supposed to serve. Because they mean something very specific. Never is not very negotiable, <laughs> right? I mean, it's never, always, same thing, not really negotiable. It's always, always, never. So I get comments sometimes that, uh, you know, it's just clear that these words are being used to bolster an argument in a way that's just completely unsupportable. As an example, I just got back from mushroom hunting and I picked some orange chanterelles. On a previous video, someone said, never wash mushrooms underwater. You should always brush them off. Okay, never. It's because the mushrooms absorb a lot of water and then when you cook them, they're full of water. So, what if I'm making soup? I'm making soup right now. As soon as I finish this video, I'm gonna go eat that soup. I could wash those chanterelles underwater. They're gonna absorb some water, and it's just gonna go into my soup, okay? Never, really, never. So what if I'm uh, sauteing the mushrooms and I'm gonna reduce them down to like even if they had just the natural water in them, I'm gonna reduce that down, take that out, and then reduce that all to like a you know a thick liquid that comes out of the mushrooms and, and like there's very little moisture left in the mushrooms. I do that all the time. Works fine. The only other possible argument I could think of for that is that the water would wash some flavor out of the mushrooms. Okay, this is a living entity. Like these mushrooms are alive, I just picked them. They're still alive essentially. And they can resist that. And I've actually tested this on other mushrooms, soak the mushrooms in water, the fresh mushrooms, and then tasted the liquid and there's no flavor in it, okay? There's no flavor, maybe a little dirt that was on the mushrooms or something. This is what I'm talking about. People use this language all the time and they use it in a way that's supposed to bolster their argument by just being more assertive, right? You just add these words to be to be more assertive, like, like this is an absolute rule that you should never ever break. What I'm saying is don't stop using them. They have a very specific meaning, but really examine it. Like stop and examine your logic, your argument. And instead of looking at it as like, you're absolutely sure of this or sure of that, Divide it into a spectrum and say there's a gray scale here and you know one is completely black and one is completely white One is completely wrong one is completely right and be intellectually honest with yourself and look at that scale and say where am I on that scale that no one should ever absolutely ever wash a chanterelle mushroom before using it for cooking now this is going to make you think that's why I say this will make you more intelligent. You can't be intelligent if you don't think. And thinking, intelligence, it's a muscle. You have to use it. Now this is gonna open all those doors that were closed. The never door, the always door, whatever it is, it's gonna open that and you're gonna have to look in there. You're gonna have to look in there and see. 
So then it's going to be like, okay, well, where did I learn that? Oh, I learned it from this mushroom person or this mushroom book or something like that, right? Well, do I trust that person? Okay, maybe you trust that person and you think that they have the credentials, like they're the mushroom guru of everything ever, right? But then you have to say, if you're being intellectually honest, are they right? Are they right? Do you know they're right? No, you believe they're right. You assume they're right. You don't know that they're right. Then it's like, well, gee, have I tested that? I have because I think outside the box and I don't trust anybody. I remember listening to Ray Pete once on the, this like radio show and someone called in and he's like, oh, I'm a biology student. I'm studying this and that. Like, you know, all this stuff you talk about, like, who should I trust? You know, because he, he has a lot of controversial ideas and he says, no one. Like, that's the obvious answer, of course. Before he said it on the radio, I said, I was like, no one. Of course, you don't trust anybody. That's what thinking outside the box is. That's what thinking for yourself is. And this will make you realize, in all likelihood, that you use these terms when they are unwarranted and that you're using them in order to bolster an argument and just be more assertive. And you're actually just kind of being douchey and you don't know what you're talking about. I started doing this a few years ago and it's completely rewired the way that I think. I'm much, much more cautious now and um, much more able to think outside the box and just leave all these doors open. You know, it's not necessary to close them. It's better to have them open. If you're interested in problem solving, in open inquiry, in creativity, in understanding the world and understanding people, this will help a lot. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people aren't, but we'll talk about that presently. The problem I have with proper is that it's very culturally biased and it really doesn't mean that much. It's like an opinion that is parading or masquerading as fact, kind of, right? So proper is another term that we use a lot that kind of like is supposed to close doors. Like you make a comment, you say things like always, never, and proper, and you're just trying to close all these doors as if like the person on the other end isn't going to be able to open any of those doors and challenge your, your assertion. I'm saying when they come up in your mind, when they come up in your language, I still slip up and, and use them inappropriately sometimes because I've been programmed from the time I was a wee lad into a matrix, a language matrix and a cultural matrix. We kind of think of ourselves as independent or if we just say things like, oh, I'm gonna think for myself or I think outside the box, that we can just do it. No, 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 no. It takes uh, years of deprogramming to start to be able to crack yourself out of this matrix. And that matrix could just be kind of the general culture that you grew up in. It could be an institutional matrix where like say, um, you know, certain uh, branch of science or something where it's widely accepted that X is true. And if you go outside that and you really start to question it and bring that feedback back into the, the culture, you will be, you know, derided, uh, ridiculed, uh, fired, uh, not get any funding called crazy. And you know, this is why progress is so slow. There's a great quote, I don't remember what it is, but if I can find it, I'll put it up on the, on the screen here. But it's something like, you know, a new idea is, you know, first like ridiculed and then finally accepted and then considered self-evident. Okay, this is the system and this is what's wrong is that it's, it's a social system, right? It's not an individual thought system and an individual intelligence. It's like a group think. So everybody knows that X is right, say, and someone else goes, like, I found some evidence, like I've been doing this research and, you know, I'm pretty sure that this is right. And everyone's like, ha ah, you're crazy. Like, fire that guy. Too bad he has tenure, right? <laughs> and then, Eventually, like enough data comes through or a couple scientists or a bunch of scientists do this and then everything switches and everyone has amnesia or they're like, well, uh, now new research shows. Yeah, no, this guy's research showed that a while ago. 
you just weren't willing to listen to him because you were trapped inside your cultural matrix. I promise that if you do this, it will open doors. I'm not saying that that will necessarily be a pleasant experience, either like doing that whole reprogramming process or ending up wherever you end up. But it's about seeing things for what they are more than what we call them or what the groupthink mentality or an institution or something already thinks of them and being more about what we don't know than what we do know. That is the key because there is no more profound truth than our vast ignorance. Okay, if you're all about what you know, where are you going? Are you going just a little bit over here to maybe explore that a little bit? No. Open all those damn doors and windows and stop blocking yourself in to this self-built, you know, self-imprisonment. Because, yeah, you grew up in it. Yeah, it's there. It exists for you to step into and think inside of. But it's you that makes the choice to step out of that prison and open the door or stay in it and stay close-minded and stop exploring the world. When you catch yourself starting to use one of these words or you're writing or you're writing a YouTube comment, for instance, just stop and look at that. Bring up that grayscale. Why do you believe this? Why do you think you know this? Is it because you watched a National Geographic special and now you think you know whatever they said is true? Or you read a scientific paper or, you know, your teacher said so, whoever, whatever thing. Put it on that scale and try to be intellectually honest and look at like about where you think you might be on that scale. And you may be way toward the end of that's absolutely right, but avoid the temptation to make that little jump to the last bit where you're absolutely right, 100% right. And not only does this scale not have just a black and a white, but it's continuously variable. And as you get new information, it might move around. Also, you're not going to be able to just pinpoint and say, I'm 80% right. You know, I'm 80% right. I'm, I'm sure that's the same thing, right? Just let things exist in that flux. This makes people very uncomfortable because we are constantly seeking certainty. It's an insecure world. It's a terrifying, insecure world we live in, right? We're, we're like dumped here. You know, we, we are born alone, essentially, and we die alone with nothing. We're born with nothing. We die. We can't take anything with us. It's terrifying, you know, and people are constantly seeking some kind of security of any kind to just know, like, what's going on, you know, existential stuff. Where's my place in the world? Who am I? right? This will mess with that too. Be like whatever your self-identity, if you, if you do this and you start following it where it naturally will lead you, you'll have to start questioning your own self-identity, your group identity, whether it's, you know, your country, your religion, your family, uh, your culture, your race, whatever. It's going to crack holes in all of that stuff. And that's why I say this, you know, this exercise comes with a warning label that the point is to question everything. The point is to open doors, not close them, not seek out these, like shop around for these truths and lock them into place, thereby locking your mind shut, like freezing your mind. How can that not make you more intelligent? You have to be more intelligent because you have to look at things and try to see them for what they really are and what your influences are, what your belief systems are, and how founded they are. And you're going to find that they're less founded than you would uh, like to think if you're very oriented toward a belief system. It's about truth and seeing truth, not looking for truths that you can latch onto that you're not sure are truths because it makes you comfortable and makes the world seem to make sense. This is kind of a, seems like a contradiction. If you're seeking truth, wouldn't you seek to find truths that you can like cement, right? You cement all these truths. No, that's, you're just shutting your world down. Stop having these opinions that are unwarranted or that are someone else's opinions that you're sure are right. 
because you think they're really smart or something like that. And if you think that what I'm proposing to you is a belief system and you're going to make that comment, this is a tool for exploration. This is a tool to make you think more. If that works, it will lead you to question literally everything. Again, whether this is a belief system, like I have to constantly question, you know, like how I'm presenting this. It's a tool for exploration and curiosity. If it's a cemented belief system, the, the inquiry is its own, should be its own self-destruction, right? It would just could cause it to uh, self-destruct eventually because it will make you have to think about it. So you would think that truth, seeking truth, questioning everything, thinking outside the box would be easy to sell people. But I don't think it really is. I think that a lot of people will give lip service to that. But when it comes down to it, they will not dig in and look at a lot of areas and they will operate within a matrix because they're comfortable with that. They've built an identity around that and they're not willing to step off that precipice and just exist in this flux state where there's way, way, way more questions and unknowns than there are answers. Because again, if there's a profound truth in this existence, it's how profoundly and vastly ignorant we are of most things. And that's just how it's going to be. And that's fine. Like, accept it. There's mystery everywhere. That's cool. There's always something to explore, right? The world is mysterious. That's okay. If you look at the soil, that soil is such a complex system of living organisms that's constantly shifting and changing. It changes with the seasons. It changes if somebody pees on it. You know, it changes when it bakes in the sun. This is not something we can understand, but it works. And that's okay. You know, if you make an assertion about never do this to your soil, never do that to your soil, always do this to your soil, you should really look at that carefully and examine the ways that that may not be true. And that is open inquiry, right? That's thinking for yourself, thinking outside the box. I'm gonna go eat my chanterelle chicken soup now. I didn't wash the mushrooms, however. I just scraped the dirt off because it was easy enough. But I would have washed them if they were really dirty. And then that water that the mushrooms absorbed would just be in my soup and the mushrooms would still be full of soup flavor and everything would be just fine and the world would continue on.